Okay, this is a scene that I just stamped out with this uh, kind of notion in mind of uh, trying to... I don't know. Uh, I want to use the word capture, but that's not really what I try to do uh, in scenes usually, but maybe reflect something, an idea or a, a visual that um, that I've seen all around me at this time of year after a kind of a heavy rain season, uh, at least as far as um, California standards go, but we have a lot of mustard plant um, blooms growing in all the hills and coastline and whatnot uh, all around the state, and um, I don't know, I, I've seen some visuals where just some hillsides are just absolutely covered in yellow, super vibrant blooms, especially like by the light of a like a high noon uh, time of day, but um, Anyways, I thought by uh, utilizing a lot of yellow tones and um, things like uh, this yellow um, gel pen would uh, help me to achieve that. But as you, I don't know if you watch this video in the end, uh, kind of in the the uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for the. Um, the detail and accent, the embellishment, that's what I'm looking for, the embellishment section of this uh, video, I've tried to use this yellow pen and it just, I don't know, for some reason, it just doesn't want to give me a nice crisp yellow dot. It works fine on the paper, but um, it's just not leaving me a dot like all my other gel pens on this uh, paper for some reason, maybe because it's glossy. So anyways, what I do is I use some of the white gel pen, add a lot of dots down. This one works beautifully. And I just went back over the top of it with um, some of this yellow uh, color box pigment ink. And that tints some of those little um, embellishments back in these hills and whatnot. But anyways, a more yellow scene, yellowish scene that I usually do uh, when it comes to stamping kind of grassy hills and whatnot, but maybe not um, kind of that explosively yellow um, type of uh, detailing that I would have hoped to have achieved going after this kind of idea of these um, kind of whole fields of mustards and bloom, but it looks okay to me. Um, I'll have to do something again. I still want to capture that um, kind of look of this super vibrant, um, you know, hills just full of uh, yellow blooms uh, reflecting all that light. I love that look. Um, but this is some variation of that or an attempt at that at least. And, uh, I don't know, it's a fun scene. It's always a fun scene to kind of do these types of things, because I love adding in these little details, like in here, you know, the, all these little flowers that kind of make a scene come alive, uh, in my opinion, doing those little details like that. And it, I don't know, it kind of makes it shimmer, in my opinion, in terms of the, uh, just the, uh, all the little colored dots, you know, which in these cases represents, um, kind of light being reflected, so we're not working with little flashlights and actual light in the scene, you know, adding these little dots like that into darker backgrounds um, kind of has that same type of uh, um, feeling of having light within a scene being reflected back in our eyes. So anyways, if you choose to watch the scene, I hope you enjoy it. And uh, as I say in this video, if you're sitting around and still you're in the deep winter temperatures. This scene is dedicated to you and uh, hope you enjoy it. Okay, I've been wanting to get to, I was gonna say a scene, but it's not really so much of a scene as um, kind of a setting that I've been interested in attempting. And that's a scene, a setting with um, a lot of uh, what I'm seeing locally here in uh, kind 
kind of the Southern California area, probably in Central California as well, but that's a lot of a, kind of this wild mustard um, plant that's uh, kind of taken over the state in so many ways in certain areas. I heard it wasn't actually an, an indigenous uh, plant. I don't know that for a fact, but um, anyways, in uh, seasons that have a lot of rain, or years that there's a lot of rain, uh, rainfall, like this year, um, it's just, there's uh, this mustard everywhere. Um, I'm not going to try and replicate anything that I've seen you know, as far as a specific setting, but I just want to kind of get the gist of, uh, I don't know, what that mustard looks like in full bloom. And uh, I know it can be really spectacular at times, just with how much yellow there might be, like on a hillside or something like that. It's almost like you can't even see anything else. The hillside is just like a super bright, bright yellow. It's like um, like this yellow, you know. But anyways, what I'm doing here is I am going to take that type of setting, and I'm going to put this cabin in it, okay? This is the cabin large stamp, and I'm just putting some dark brown and some greens around here. You know, for the most part, I I use um, tone over the top of this after I stamp it out, but I'm just going to try to apply some of the tone on there inherently, and um, just start the the impression out with already a, you know a lot of inherent colors rather than what I'm saying is rather than coloring it black and then coloring everything in afterwards um, to achieve the uh, kind of the hue. All right, my green pens are a little bit dry, so I'm hoping this stamps out dark enough. There's a way to reinvigorate these pens, by the way. You just kind of pop open the back and you know add some reinker to that little area. And I'm not going to do that right now. It take me a few minutes to do, but uh, let's see if I can get a strong enough impression with this. Okay. Going a little bit off center because I want to have this kind of this hill in the background. All right, I'm stamping with a little bit of dry ink, so I might have to use a little bit more pressure. I'm standing up, stamping this. I usually, you know, stamp all around as opposed to just putting one kind of central pressure, so. With stamps with a lot of surface area like this, and this has a lot of surface area, and it's big, so you have to kind of apply pressure in all the different areas at times. Having a good amount of um, kind of uh, blotter paper underneath this um, helps out as well. Okay, a little bit dry in those trees, but uh, oh well. See that right there? These are darker and this one's lighter, but uh, eh, so be it. That's dark enough for me. Okay, I need to make a note to remember to re-ink these. And you can just re-ink it with a re-inker fluid. These are dye-based markers, by the way. Okay, let's do the same thing with this, um, it's called the Soft Hill, okay? I'll stamp those in the background. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to start this out with, uh, oh, let's go with a darker green. I'm going to use a pad, because I, I know there's more ink on these pads, I, I think. Let me see, let me go with a pine green. Some of my pads are finally starting to kind of come apart, I notice they're kind of crumbling a little bit. I don't know if you can see that right here. Let me see if I can get a close-up and see that right there. There's been some degradation in the pad itself um, after a very long time. These pads, as I've mentioned in other videos, they might be 15 to 20 years old, and I use them a lot. Usage doesn't break them down there, you know, it's just uh, time, you know, it's, it's foam, so 
um, that'll happen, but, you know, if something gives me 20 years of use, I'm really, I'm good with it. Okay, that was green. I swiped a few of that mark in there, and I'm going to put a little bit of this yellow marker in here as well to give this hillside a little bit of variation. I'm getting a little bit of green on this tip here, but I've never really worried about that. <laughs> There's a bit of my pad right there, see? That felt. I mean, not felt, but that sponge. Okay, masking off the uh, cabin. I don't need to mask off the trees here. Because they're, for the most part, solid. Okay. We'll see if I can get a good impression with this. Or with those colors of ink. Yeah, okay. There's a little bit of variation in there. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. Okay, where I've put that um, yellow. It doesn't read so much as yellow because the yellow is mixing with some of the green, but you can see we can get a little bit of variation just in the impression as opposed to having to add all of that uh, ink on there um, to achieve that variation, okay? Which we'll do, but we'll just start it off with a little bit of variety. In terms of temperature and hue and, I don't know, just variations of green inherently in the impression itself, okay? Okay, let's go for another mountain back here, or hill, okay. You don't need to mask off the trees, just, uh, you know, a little bit of that cabin area, all right? Okay, my pen here seems to be kind of looking a little bit funky as well. See that? Uh, try to focus here, see that? That's the way those pens get after, you know, 20 years of use. I can tell these things are that old because that's not even a new barrel for the, uh, for the Marvy markers. That was the old one. They had these black ones later with a kind of a black label strip. And that was a long time to go for those ones even. Okay, now, we have this area around here that's just blank, and it looks, you know, obviously very fragmented and isolated in terms of that cabin within this scene, so we're just going to take our sedge filler stamp and fill in the surrounding area with some additional texture. Um, what color you can do that with? Well, you can do it with any color, but I'm going to do it with green. I'll do it with the pine green again. The one that's kind of falling apart. Okay. You don't necessarily, you don't need a stamp positioner for that, you know. If I get it a little into the cabin, you know, that texture is not going to matter. I'll show you. See? I see a little bit of that texture in that cabin, but it's not any big deal, right? Okay. So that means you don't have to match it up perfectly. Don't try to get, like, right to the edge of that cabin or something like that, or stamp it right to the edge of that soft hill. Okay, these stamps, you know, are meant to blend in with one another, hopefully in a, the easiest way possible. There are some things you don't want to overlap, you know, next to each other. That's more if it's kind of a real solid image um, that you don't want showing through, like the cabin or something like that. Okay, so those are done. Um, hmm. I was thinking about putting kind of some nice billowing soft clouds in the background. I'm wondering if I want to do that. Let's just do it. Um, I could just put some streaks of color up there, you know, to, to represent the sky and, I 
know, kind of more wispy clouds, but let's add that in there. Sometimes these uh, more the cloud cumulus can give it kind of a, I don't know, maybe a happier look or something like that. If that's the right word or description. Okay, now I am masking off those mountains. I don't want too much of that cloud in there, but if I do get some of the cloud in there, it's not going to matter. Three impressions out there. I see I didn't even mask it off that time. It's not any big deal. Okay, so that's our foundation. Our next step will be adding some additional color and tone to kind of give the scene some body and kind of flesh it out. So. big crumb of a piece of a stamp pad that I thought was right here. I don't know where it went. Okay. So let's look at this now. Um, this is how, this is what I'm thinking in terms of a, a lighting scheme. Most of the times, you know, I've done these quite a bit, so, um, not the specific composition, I never did it, but just in terms of lighting, okay, um, we can see on the stamp itself, you know, the sides are darker, right? You know, with the use of all those little dots, the back of the cabin is even darker, but we can see that little darkened porch and the rooftop is illuminated, all right? I'm going to do that same type of thing as far as my shading scheme on the image itself. Okay, so where areas that are darker than the top, I'll make those darker with some additional tone. Okay, this won't look too good if I just leave it, you know, white like that, the white of the page. So we need to get some color up here. But now, in terms of the landscape, I mean, there's no right and wrong, but I think it's just better to not treat this whole area around here the same, okay? I think some areas on the mountain would look good if it's illuminated, meaning making some areas of the mountains, you know, the hills darker than other areas. The areas that you do that in, I mean, there's no right and wrong here. It's just pick somewhere and just kind of go with it. Clouds up here are fine as is, but I think some additional tone in here would be good just to kind of frame it off a little bit. If I tone all these areas down here and I just kind of leave that as is, sometimes this area up here looks, it looks too, I don't know, separate from the scene itself. It doesn't look integrated. Um, the, the same thing with the grass down here, just have a little bit of an oscillation between light and dark. I think some areas down here, I like to put a little bit of shading underneath my structures and especially things like trees. So I'd make this area a little bit of a darker green, perhaps. Maybe this area out here would be lighter, okay? But um, that's just the general thought that I have right now. You know, if I have to think about it, most of the times I just kind of get into it and I just start laying down some color. I don't know, maybe it's doing it in a subconscious way, but, um, it's really, ooh, that is really wet. I have not used that. Oh, you know what I did too? And I, 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 um, cleaned these out before I, uh, started this video this time, but this is really, really wet. And I don't, I probably haven't, what color is this? Distress Peel Paint. I haven't used this color too much, but I really like it. Um, I'm starting in that shadowy area. Let's get some, this is with way too much color on it. If it was really a lot lighter, no big deal. Let's get some of that 
moisture. Oh my gosh. These are sponges after all, so they do hold a lot of water. Okay. Okay, let's see here. Alright. Better. I like a lot of uh, control when applying tones. Uh, not that I don't like the look of the more kind of spontaneous, uh, you know, types of uh, artwork out there. Like, I love calligraphy, the look of it. I can't do it, but, uh, you know, things like that and watercolors. I have so much respect for watercolorists. I, I love the loose kind of uh, feeling and the, uh, the spontaneity of it all. Spontaneity of it. Uh, sorry, I can't talk today. The spontaneity um, of things like lettering. Okay, so we see we've left a little bit of light and we have a little bit of areas of darkness, okay? This looks kind of weird to me. Let's go a little, a little bit of tone in there, like so, okay. All right. Hmm. I think I'm going to lay that. I haven't forgotten that mustard, but um, I think I'm going to lay that down afterwards. Boy, that is a really great green here. Peeled paint. It's not so hot, bright, so it's kind of a, it's kind of mellow, but it but it's rich at the same time. That's a really that's a really good combination, you know. You want it rich, but uh, kind of mellow at the same time. I guess it depends on the application of it, how much you put down, perhaps. Okay, this is jungle green. I'm just, you know, it's layering what you have, okay? If I didn't have this, I wouldn't miss it. But since I have it, I'm gonna try it out. If you have like a Christmas green, go ahead and lay that down in there. If you have colors that are just too bright upon, you know, your application of it, then kind of mellow them out, you know, layer some other tones on the top of it, on top of them. That's what's, you know, one of the beauties of uh, dye based inks is that you can layer colors down and uh, add colors over the top. Speaking of that, let's try some Distress Ink Tea Dye, okay? Let's lay some of that down on this. I don't know. Let me see if I can see the yeah, it's good. That reminds me of uh, maybe a slightly lighter version of brown. The Marvy Brown, number six, which is one of my favorite colors. Okay, um, this is brown, this tea dye, so let's add some of it into this cabin. That's about the right value to start off with because it's kind of light. Okay. All right, but so that the grass and cabin are related in a way, I will apply some of the same tone to my grassy area, okay? So it's not just brown here and green out there and blue up there. You have a little bit of brown in the green, a little bit of green in the brown. You don't have to do it with the darkest of, you know, the darkest of colors, but um, you know, using some of the, the lighter versions of it as kind of a base commonality um, really works out quite effectively, um, in my opinion. Okay, so, all right, I thought I had it here somewhere. Walnut stain. As far as I remember, that's one of the slightly darker ones, you know, at least the ones that I have. Let's give it a shot here. 
kind of adding some color under those eaves. Hopefully making the cabin look more three-dimensional, right? The vertical edges are darker, so the top looks lighter. Um, but that rooftop looks a little bit uh, boring, just being kind of all that one value, so I'll put on a streak some. It's supposed to look rustic anyways. Streaking in some additional tone. Okay, let's add some more of this walnut stain to the uh, side. Let's add some of it down in the shadows as well, okay? Adding some of it down into the grass, and meadow, and hills in the background. Okay. I don't know. We're almost there, I think, as far as making a, you know, reasonably full kind of a statement on lighting. a little bit on that cabin and underneath the eaves. All right, shadow, hitting the shadow a little bit more. Kind of right along the base, it, it kind of anchors it in to the scene more. All right, um, hmm. I, I don't know if it's going to be dark enough to really... Oh, uh, yes it is. I was going to say, I didn't know if it would be dark enough to really matter. Like, if you start applying some color and you, you just don't see anything at all, then, you know, you don't need to use it. No reason to. Like, if I tried, if this bamboo was a little bit lighter than what already exists on the page, I don't know if it would necessarily do anything. Especially if it's not brighter, you know, you can kind of add some brightness to certain areas, but if it's lighter, not lighter, I mean, if it's lighter and not brighter, then just move on to your next color, whatever uh, inks you're working with. Okay. All right, so this, after all, is a statement on that, the spring blooms. Let's see. And you know what I found here? This distress, I didn't even know I had it here, on, even on my desk. I didn't pull this out, I just pulled a stack of them out yesterday, but mustard seed. Huh. If that's not the right yellow for this scene, I don't know what one would be, in, at least in terms of title. We'll see what it looks like in terms of uh, the application of it. It's kind of a... Uh, I was going to say it's a little bit of a darker yellow than, like, say, something like this. This Marvy real neutral yellow. This one might have, I don't know, maybe a slight faint orange in it, but not much, you know. Just slightly enough to... Uh, Add a little bit of character to it, okay? Okay, it's kind of brightening in the background. It's not lightening it, it up. It's making it darker because it is a color that you're applying to it, but it is brighter, so things... I don't know, put a, it, put a zip of uh, vibrancy into it. This one is brighter. Um, meaning more intense than I thought it would be, but not in a bad way, okay? All right, let's add a little bit of tone. Now see how that sky really stands out in terms of uh, the, uh, the amount of saturation, which is none up there compared to the bottom part, okay? So let's add a little bit of uh, 
tone to it, just so that it relates to the uh, scene a little bit more. This is Summer Sky Memento. Okay. And as in so many scenes of mine, I like to kind of frame off the edges. So I'll add this in the top right and left corner. I am coming down to that hill a little bit, you know, because it's good to bring this, you know, some of that blue down there. But you see, it's kind of making that area stand out a little bit more. You just darken in the areas around there a little bit. And let's bring some of this blue down here into the grass. It might change the hue slightly, but again, I'm kind of just doing it to create a bit of a, a relationship between other um, areas of the scene. In this case, it would be the sky. Bring a little of that blue maybe onto the rooftop here, you know. Maybe the roof is capturing, you know, some of that light and reflecting it. Okay, I stamped out that cloud in salvia blue, so I'm going to finish it a little bit more with some additional salvia. All right, now I stamped that cabin in brown. Um, it's this brown, it's the number 18 brown, which they also have a Marvy matchable for. If you have these pens too, like this, you can always kind of just wipe some of that color into that and then just start applying it. All right, but I have the pad for it, so I'm gonna use that. I don't know if many people use these markers. These are the Marvy brush markers. They have that really big fat tip back in the uh, um, like the 80s uh, and 90s, early 90s. Uh, they didn't have uh, stamp pads. We didn't talk about stamp pads. They, they didn't exist as uh, raised dye-based pads, which you know we all tend to use in rubber stamping these days, but uh, back then they didn't didn't use that. I think they didn't know how to do a raised pad. They were all in set, so that's useless for stamps because you can't get it in, you know, unless this, all the stamps were smaller than the pad themselves. You couldn't really use that, so. Anyways, everyone used brush markers. Um, Dee Grunig was uh, really big on color and with all of her really awesome, bold designs, you know. Um, uh, those pens were perfect for it, and then uh, I learned it over at a stamp in the hand company, and um, we use those colors all the time. Everyone knew the, uh, you know, all the numbers of the, of the, uh, uh, the line. It's like, oh, do you, you know, do you have a number twelve or something like that, or a number nine pink or a number whatever, what is it, seven orange, you know. Okay, adding some of this additional brown in certain areas. Okay. Putting that brown down there, I think, anchors it into the scene yet even more, and I think I used this bottle green, the number 25. Ooh, that's really dark. Let's be careful with that one. Let's bring some of that green into it. That's what a lot of the trees kind of look like. The trees were actually, I think, stamped in number four green, but bottle green will provide a nice dark, uh, tone for a little bit more variation within the, uh, the grassy area. Okay. I don't like how brown that is right there. Okay. It's too brown for me. Same thing with right here. 
So I'm going to bring some of this green over the top of it, you know, and make it more, you know, a greenish brown or whatever. Okay. Maybe I like so. With the darker colors, as always, um, really utilize the, uh, the drier incarnations of them, and I'm kind of tapping it out a lot. But I'm still using that same inking to apply tone in multiple impressions, using just more taps, okay? You don't want to go with a really super wet um, foam tip here with a, you know, a really dark color and start leaving, you know, like these oval, you know, impressions everywhere. But you can see how dry this is right here. It doesn't look like that one, but these drier impressions now, as you apply it, you know, you can get, you can lay some color down, but you're doing it in a very slow fashion, I meaning you have a lot of control over it like that, okay? But see, adding it down in these little areas like that, it's really uh, easy to do. And again, it's not going to be like, you know, like brush calligraphy where you're doing this bold statement, you know, you're just kind of applying this in a pretty methodical way. It's careful, and that way you can just control how much you lay down. Okay, now that looks okay to me at this stage in the game as far as kind of a color statement. It's a lot more yellow than I would typically do, if you've seen my other grassy terrains. But... This is supposed to be that mustard. Now look at this pen that I have. It's the Uniball Signo, but it's the yellow one. I don't know if I've ever used it before. In fact, I was, was in, it was on my shelf here, and I, th I was thinking about doing this mustard thing. I thought, okay, I have this color right here. Let's let's go ahead and utilize it. Um, here's the Mar uh, Sharpie Peach too. Maybe that'll provide kind of a a little bit of a variation. All right, let's see what we can do here in terms of uh, really adding some, I don't know, some we'll see if I can do anything at all if this adds. I was thinking, I was wondering if this was uh, going to be more opaque. Uh, See, are you adding on at all? It's working like that. It looks real translucent to me. Okay, it's going on, but not as uh, kind of paint-like as the white paint pens. Okay, I see that I see that some of this is being laid down. It's like I don't know, it's like not applying on the glossy cardstock as much as I'd like to. Hmm. Now, let me see if I can get this going here. I might need a yellow paint pen instead of this gel pen. Let me try this. I know this one's going to work, but it's not so yellowy. It's kind of more peach. Yeah, that's what I want. I want ease of application. It's a little bit more orangey, though. Let's lay some of it down. I didn't like it. But I do want some of that yellow as well. Okay. Uh, let's 
Let's see if you can see that. Those little dots kind of clustered. Kind of cluster it a little bit more, you know? Like that. Don't put every dot, like, you know, perfectly spaced out like a quarter inch from each other. Otherwise it looks kind of, you know, it's, there's too much pattern in it. Um, and that's what we all tend to do, uh, myself included, for some reason. It's like we want to, we have this pattern type of thing going on in our heads. And it's kind of harder to go kind of random with us sometimes. So it's like I have to kind of consciously um, think that and do it even after all these years of doing it. Okay, back in the background. I have, you know what? Let me try something here. All right, let me try. Let me try this one again. This is working beautifully on this matte paper, but let me see if this is. This is just not working on glossy. I don't know why. It's like almost like it's a different type of pen. Let me try something though. I just realized. I just looked at my shelf, and I do have some um, color box canary yellow. And from the looks of it, I don't think I've ever used it. And I have no idea how long I've had it. It's open, but uh, for the life of me, I cannot remember. I've ever used it before. Um, I'm thinking about going in and adding some of this tone in here, and hopefully, in, a, in an ideal situation, it will look more uh, kind of painter. I'm looking around for more. gel pens. Boy, I have some gel pens that I haven't used for a really, really long time, if ever. In fact, I didn't even know I had them. Even though they're right in front of me. I bet you these ones won't work at all. Some of these gel pens have been sitting around for 10, year, ten years, probably. I'll see if I can get that one working. <laughs> it would be a good idea for me to pause this video, but um, when doing all this type of thing, but um, I don't know, I'm just letting it roll. Okay, so let's try to add some of this. What was it again? Color box canary. All right, let's see what this is going to look like. Kind of blotting some of it off there. Okay. All right. Now I'm not trying to add this everywhere, like over that whole hill. It's not going to be like one solid um, application, I don't think, of this yellow. I'm just going in here and kind of adding this little element of uh, um, I guess it would be kind of a textured yellow in some ways because I am sponging this on I don't know, it's a cotton swab but uh, it's kind of in the sponging type of uh, application style Okay, I like when I see it. It's very subtle, but um, it's got a little patchy areas up here of that yellow. See it? It's kind of blotchy, but 
Everything looks good from a distance, you know. I want to kind of create this, I don't know, that when I, so this whole big hillside of a covered in mustard out at, you know, passing by at high noon, it, the whole hill looked like it was kind of glowing, you know, all those uh, mustard plant uh, blossoms. It's like an explosion of color or of yellow, all right. That's what um, I'd like to kind of reference here in the scene in some way. All right, I think, I think I just thought of something I can do too. All right, you know this yellow, this yellow is writing, but it's not writing real well. I'm going to, this gives me an idea. Let's try something here. I believe the Signo Uniball White, this big fat roller one. Yeah, no problem with this one showing up, okay? It's very large <laughs> dots. Maybe because this one's a, a bigger roller. I don't know what point it is. Like a, it's like a point seven or something like that. Uh, but what I'm getting at here is I'm going to lay down some of these dots in white, okay? Which looks pretty good in itself, but it's kind of not what I'm going after. I'm going after yellow versions of it. I'm going to lay some of this down in white and then just go over it with that white pigment, I mean a uh, yellow pigment ink, and turn, hopefully, those white dots yellow, okay? And we'll see if that works, you know? If it works, then great. If it doesn't, then we'll have some white flowers, you know? If it works, we have mustard. If we don't, then we have uh, pearly everlasting. Okay, let's see. Well, this white is getting real textured. You know, the kind of the texture that I want. That. Okay, okay, yeah. Here we go, see it right around here. It's kind of up in the, uh, the background hills as well. And we'll add some more of it down here too. For some of you that are kind of still in the winter season and uh, it's really cold still, you know, this one's for you, you know, we'll bring a little bit of a uh, spring blooms into your, uh, into your lives. Or it's, this one's dedicated to you. Okay, now this is going to be colored in uh, yellow in some of these areas, but I don't want to put too much over here, you know, because these little textured dots are kind of more, they represent, you know, kind of reflecting light hitting uh, the blossom, the blooms. So in the shade, I mean, you know, I don't want to put too many of those. It, they stand out too much in those areas, okay? You can go pretty crazy with this. I mean, this one, I, you know, this one is going nuts with the pen. I normally 
I don't think I would, but I, w I don't think I would add this many. But I, I don't know. This this scene is kind of about somewhat of an extreme, you know, in terms of a, a visual. You know, it's about a, kind of an explosion of a, of color and reflected color and reflected light, colored lights coming off of, uh, you know. A big, uh, a big uh, natural, natural statement. Okay, so we have a lot of twinkly, bright blooms in there for sure. All right, so let's go in and let's, I don't know, we'll see if this works or not. I don't know, seems to. I'll kind of oscillate. I'll have some of those little dots white. I don't, I don't want to color all of them out. Let's see if this, we can pick this up on the camera at all. All right, can you see that there's some of these are kind of white and some of them are yellowish. You see where I've kind of gone in, in some areas here. Super close up here, but when you hold it out at arm's distance, um, I think having a little bit of variation in there is good. And I think it looks pretty good as far as uh, uh, what I'd like to convey or whatever state <laughs> visually in the scene. done this before, but I haven't done it in a long time, uh, where I'm kind of applying a color using this kind of swab technique. Okay, so it's got a pretty good shimmer going with um, kind of the oscillation of white and yellow blossoms. I tell you what though, in some of these areas where I've, you know, applied some of that yellow over the top of the white, I'm going to add in a few accent dots yet again to create an additional layer of a uh, texture and variation. All right, so that is that. I tell you what, just for a little bit of variation again, let's say there's this cabin right here. And I don't know, just around the cabin, let's add a different hue. Let's go and um, kind of a violet tone goes really well with green. So let's add just a couple little additional flowers or something, you know, like something just different, maybe around the uh, cabin, some purple flowers amongst a sea of uh, mustard. 
kind of subtle because I put it down you know, at the base of that cabin where it's a little bit dark, so the values are about the same, but I don't know if, can you see that change of hue a little bit in terms of the uh, that violet right in there? Let me add a little bit more. Something like that. All right? So, pull out a little bit more. It's very subtle, but just a little bit of a change in there. I know you can put some out in the field as well if you want to. All right, now. I think I'm going to try something. I'm going to add. I would usually do this before I did that, all those dots, but um, I think I'm going to add just one more layer of depth, OK? I just want the tops of this um, rocks and leaves to have loose little bushes here. And I think I want to do them in black. All right. It's going to have to be pretty dark, so I might need to re-ink my black pad. The ink hasn't kind of soaked into the uh, pad real yet, you know, completely, so it's kind of inking up a little bit uneven. Let me just do it that way. Okay. All right, let's go for some of the tops of some of these leaves. stand it a little bit higher, but that's fine. Okay, just to kind of even it out slightly. How about these ones over here? Something like that. A little bit of framing at the bottom of the scene, okay? I'm looking at this because I'm kind of contemplating if I want to add a little bit of framing at the top, but I, I don't think I do. Um, in terms of an image, but I do think that something that wouldn't hurt is just to go one step a little bit. What color is on there? <laughs> um, darker, just on the left and right corner. Let's try the memento here. It's a Bahama blue. Okay. 
Okay, you can see the difference between the uh, left and right side. See, I feel that that intensity and value match with this whole area a little bit more. Right here, it seems kind of pale, right? Which could be good and bad. I mean, it, you know, the scene kind of comes forward a little bit more. But I just feel that this is a little bit more integrated in terms of the, the rest of the scene. Just by putting a little bit more on you know, the left and right side. not so mustardy. <laughs> I wish, now I wish I can get this pen going. I don't know what's what's up with it. It, it is a different type of pen. I don't know. It's a Uniball Signo. But I don't know why. That yellow must be a different type of ink. It's just not it kind of giving me a nice crisp little dot. But hey, sometimes you gotta make do and just use what you have. So the Signo Ball white one which is much more juicy and fluid of a pen left those dots down there and what we did was we just went in there and colored it with a little bit of the pigment ink you know because the uh, the white you know gel will accept some of that pigment um, ink on there um, as we've seen here but anyways um, well that's what happens sometimes in a scene you just uh, you just gotta go with the flow and uh, see what happens. So, anyways, uh, kind of a yellow scene. I still want to do one that's more kind of explosively yellow. Maybe I was a little bit too conservative on this one. I still added a little bit of that green in there, but I don't know what else I would have done. I, you had to have some variation in here for that kind of yellow to stand out. If this was all just pure yellow, I don't, I don't know how that would look. It might look kind of strange, um, but um, hmm. I, mean, I wouldn't think bad to add a few little other touches in here, but um, I think for the most part this is done. And I like what's going on in here in terms of variation, for the most part. I like the fact that I'm glad I stamped this cabin out in that green and brown to begin with, instead of going with black. I, I like what's happening up here in the tree, just in terms of that little bit of darkness around the trunks and that green up here. Um, as far as the setting in here goes, this looks okay in terms of the transitions right here, but having kind of these darker strips across here just to kind of break up this big wide area I think is uh, important. And just having those little patches right here, those little variations, little streaks of color here and there, you know, as opposed to just having this one, you know, uniform value, you know, when you do it all the same value without these little kind of variations in here, it tends to flatten out that space, you know, and it makes it look a little bit too monotonous, I think, you know, it's a little bit of shading here and there uh, is good to do. Um, like I said in the beginning, it doesn't really matter where you put it, you know, as long as it's in there somewhere. And, uh, just a simple sky, clouds, and a little bit of, uh, left and right, um, kind of vignetting with some additional tones, using the same colors. So, here's the thing. We have green hills, blue sky, and a brown cabin, okay? Whatever you stamp out these objects in, I would always come back in and add that same tone, whatever colors you've used in these, you know, on all your different areas for, you know, part of the shading. And then, see so like this brown here, there's some of that brown in the grain here. And, uh, you know, there's some of that green in the brown, a little bit, at least. But, 
Now, I don't necessarily have greens and browns up in my sky, but I do have some of this blue that was used up here in my hills. And I put a, remember, I don't know if you remember, but I put a little bit of that blue on my rooftop here. So you have continuity between all of these different things because you have, you know, common color or colors used in all the different regions, okay? And that makes it a little bit more cohesive um, when you do something like that. It creates a, a relationship and it doesn't have to be real strong. I don't see like real strong browns in here. I mean, a little bit more there, but you know, it still looks green to be down here. And, um, you know, the hills aren't blue hills because we put that, some of that blue down into the, uh, the grassy areas down here. And the cabin doesn't necessarily, I mean, that rooftop doesn't look blue, sky blue to me, but um, just having a little bit of that kind of real faint um, hint of that cool color show, probably doesn't show up on this video at all, but you can see that, that cabin rooftop, you know, this is, here, I'll let me show you. This is white, you know, right here. But you can see that even on the rooftop there, it, where the areas are light, but it's not just your stark white of the paper, all right? And that's where I've used some of that blue down here. So a lot of different color scheme changes, you know, within the different regions here and different objects, but there's continuity between all of them because you've used some of the lighter colors. So that's something to, to think about doing, um, you know, just in terms of uh, approaching some things like that, where you have a lot of different um, elements um, working in the scene. So anyways, thanks so much for watching, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the scene of... Uh, I don't even know if I'm going to title this one some kind of mustard. It's going to be like, I want to do a scene where you call it like mustard in bloom or something like that. But um, I don't know, I might save that title for another one. But I don't know, yellow, yellow landscape, yellow landscape would be a horrible uh, name. I don't know, I'll figure it out. Thanks for watching.